Welcome to Books of Our Time, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and seen nationwide. Today we shall discuss a book entitled Beautiful Souls by Eyal Press. The book is a study, a series of case studies actually, about why some people do the right and moral thing while most people don't. The work's author, Eyal Press, is with me to discuss his book. And I am Lawrence R. Velvel, the Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Eyal, thank you for coming up from New York uh, for the show. Thank now, you the book, me. as I said, is a series of case studies. Uh, and some of the points are made, uh, you know, repeatedly, and other points are particular to a particular case. But in any event, why don't you very briefly, in a sentence or two each, describe the five case studies and how, tell us after, after that how you came to focus on those particular five case studies. Each story in the book involves an individual who says no to something else, which I will explain as we talk. Um, but uh, the book opens with uh, the story of a, a police captain named Paul Gruninger. He's the only character in the book who's no longer living. Um, he was uh, a Swiss police captain in charge of a canton in northeast Switzerland. Um, and in 1938, he was given the order to enforce the law of the Swiss government to bar refugees, in particular Jewish refugees, from entering Switzerland. This was just at the time that Nazi Germany had taken over Austria, and these refugees were fleeing the German Reich. Uh, Gruninger, the first character in the book, uh, disobeys this law, although he is a police captain. Uh, the second story in the book uh, is about a Serb named Alexander Yevtich. Uh, his nickname is Acho. Uh, he is uh, an individual who says no not to the law but to groupthink, um, to group pressure. And uh, in 1991, in the middle of a war between Serbia and Croatia, uh, Acho, uh, who is a Serb, uh, risks his own life to spare hundreds of Croats from mistreatment and abuse and possible death. He did. His uh, Serb officer told him, go down the line and pick out all the people who are Serbs, and he went down the line and he uh, collected a bunch of Croats too. He, ma he made up names for them, yeah. right. He pretended they were Serbs, yeah. uh, these Croats, um, in the middle of this war, uh, in a detention camp. Um, the third character in the book is an Israeli named Avner Wishnitzer. And he is uh, a character who, who ends up actually saying no to himself, that is, to his earlier self. Um, he goes from being an officer in the most elite unit in the Israeli army to being a refusenik, uh, meaning he selectively disobeys orders from his military commanders, in particular the order to serve in the occupied territories, which he has a kind of awakening uh, about uh, and feels is wrong. Um, the fourth character in the book is an American. Uh, her name is Layla Weidler. She was a broker at um, a financial company and she was asked and told to sell a financial product she thought was being misleadingly advertised. She turned out to be right about that. Uh, she lost her job for it. She says no to greed and apathy. Um, which in, in America, I think, are probably the forces that uh, create more conformity than, than yeah, anything else. Yeah, well, just else. to interject something, they wanted her, she was a broker for Stanford. They wanted she, her to sell Stanford's phony product. That's right. Yeah. She, she, the, the firm she, she worked for uh, happened to be the Stanford Financial Group. Uh, in 2002, she was told to sell certificates of deposit for Stanford. Um, everyone was told the same thing. These are uh, great high-yielding CDs and tell your clients they get great returns every year. Layla asked too many questions. Uh, she wanted to know how high yields and consistent returns go together. Uh, she asked enough questions that management fired her. Uh, and then she tried very hard to alert the SEC and the media to what was going on uh, to no avail. She failed at that. Uh, and then many years later, the SEC contacted her and said, Ms. Weidler, we'd, we'd like to talk to you about your former employer, Stanford. Uh, this was when it was revealed that they were running an $8 billion Ponzi scheme. Um, the final character in the book uh, is uh, Daryl Vandeveld. Uh, he was um, a military prosecutor sent to Guantanamo, um, believed very much in the mission that he was sent, which was, in his mind, 
to uh, prosecute the worst of the worst, people with um, terrorists with the blood of uh, U.S. soldiers uh, on their hands. He had served in Iraq, earned a Bronze Star. Um, but during his time in Guantanamo, he had a crisis of conscience. He was asked to prosecute um, a uh, case uh, involving an attack on U.S. soldiers. And as he investigated the case and did his, uh, his work to bring the case forward, he, he came to realize that the suspect, that the uh, detainee um, who had been fingered for the crime uh, very likely didn't do it and furthermore was a minor uh, and furthermore had been mistreated and abused while in detention and held for years. Um, Vandeveld ended up uh, testifying for the defense in this case um, and uh, it turned out the judge uh, throughout the case said that uh, exactly what Vandeveld had suspected was, was right. Um, and so in each of these stories um, I tell, uh, I focus on an individual who at great risk, at great personal risk, sometimes for career purposes, other times risk to one's life, um, ends up uh, sticking to their principles in a, in a very dramatic and, um, and stubborn way. There is a question that I would like to ask, which really has very little to do with the stories in the book per se, but it, I found it extremely striking. Early in the book, when I think it's either in, a, in the prologue or a prologue or else in the uh, chapter on Gruninger, the Swiss police officer, you talk about a group of German soldiers who were uh, delegated to uh, kill hundreds of thousands of Jews. You know, the old story, shoot them in the back of the neck and they fall into the pit. And the officer who was commanding the soldiers to do this said, that some of you older men, if you don't wish to do this, older men, that was, that was what struck me. If you don't wish to do this, you don't have to participate. Do you have any idea what caused this German officer who, in my generation, we crudely but referred to them as Krauts, which is the way we thought about them, and I still do. Do you have any idea why he told the older people that they don't have to participate and then some didn't? Um, yeah, I do, I do open the book uh, with that story and I actually v went to the site of that particular incident, that particular massacre that took place where uh, an estimated 1,200 Jews in a village in um, Poland were rounded up and, and killed all on one day, um, all by a battalion. Most of the soldiers in that battalion were not members of the Nazi party. Um, they were not um, doing this out of ideological conviction. So the mystery is, well, why did they do it? Um, and uh, we, I tell the story early in the book because I think we have uh, a general belief, a sense, that soldiers, the low, the low ranking, the rank and file soldiers in Nazi Germany, in a totalitarian country like that, really had no choice. They were given their orders. If they didn't follow their orders, um, you know, they would meet with the same fate as, as the Jews did, as the victims. Uh, and, and there was really no space for dissent. Now, broadly speaking, that's true uh, in Nazi Germany. Obviously, it was a totalitarian country. But we have this extraordinary story um, that historians have written about in which this uh, commander, Major Trapp, gathers the men and says if any of the old, before any of the killing is done, if any of you uh, do not want to participate, uh, you do not have to participate. And um, I tell the story because um, it, it brings across, it, it, it drove home to me, um, that even in situations of seemingly total conformity, we find that there are some people who don't go along and that sometimes there are more choices than we assumed there wouldn't be. Um, so in this case, none of the soldiers who stepped forward and put their guns down uh, were shot or prosecuted or thrown in jail. In fact, there is no documented case of a German soldier refusing an order during that period um, who, is, who is executed for it. Do you have any idea why the major said that? The anecdote is, is described at length in a book I, I, I mentioned called Ordinary Men by the historian Christopher Browning. And um, according to Browning's account, um, 
he was horrified. Um, he was personally uh, uh, troubled and morally troubled uh, by what, by the enterprise, <laughs> by the order, by the mission that he was uh, overseeing. And keep in mind, this was at the beginning of the truly horrific killing uh, yes. that began. It didn't begin instantly. The initial uh, uh, idea of, of, of the Nazis was to simply expel uh, the Jews. Um, the quote-unquote final solution and the horrific uh, uh, systematic murder uh, begins a little later uh, in the yeah. war. Yeah. And this is at that period. So this is a battalion, not yeah. mainly yeah. Nazis. Yeah. And he is simply horrified. Yeah, that began with the Einsatzgruppen, as they uh, went into the Ukraine and so on. All right. You, you point out that in your five, uh, f five case studies, these are normal people, not dislike, uh, sometimes even dislikable people, and not motivated particularly by any uh, intellectual rationalizations or anything like that, just normal individuals who found themselves in a s certain situation said, I'm not going to do that. Maybe you could elaborate on, on why, you know, why, how and why and in what ways these people were just normal blokes like you and me and the people in our audience. That was a, a, a very striking thing to me. And, and, and I have to say, um, I, th I wrote the book in part um, because um, I wrote it against uh, another popular perception, which is that, um, you know, people who do the right thing in, in these uh, very stressful and risky situations, who stand by their principles, are, you know, in a sense, the Gandhis or Mandelas of the world, these kind of larger than life saintly figures, um, people who uh, we, we put on a pedestal and think, um, well, there are every, every generation or so one of those is born, uh, but the rest of us are not uh, Gandhi or Mandela. True enough, um, alas, but what you find in studies of um, individuals who hid Jews during World War II, um, people like Oskar Schindler, uh, people like the characters in my book, is that these were not saintly figures, um, that these were disarmingly ordinary people. Um, in the case of Paul Gruninger, this Swiss police captain I just mentioned, um, who saves uh, hundreds, possibly thousands of refugees before he is caught, allowing them into Switzerland against the law at the risk to his career. Um, uh, you know, no one who knew Gruninger, no one who, uh, who looks back on this case, uh, sees him as this kind of heroic type. Uh, to the contrary, he was, a, he was an ordinary guy. He, um, he didn't stand out. He seemed to be a rule follower and a rule enforcer. Um, I met his daughter, and his daughter repeatedly described him to me as normal. He was normal in terms of his politics. He wasn't outspoken. He wasn't um, especially religious. So there's this mystery that I begin the book with, and I want to figure it out because um, you know these these people are not uh, uh, these heroic figures. And furthermore, I think I think in that sense um, the book should be both a challenge and an inspiration to readers because on the one hand, when we put people up on pedestals, you know it's, it's sort of uh, uh, we think we're honoring them, but at the same time we separate them from us. You know they are these heroes and we are not. And part of the message of the book is, well, you know, these are flawed people, just like you and me, uh, so maybe we shouldn't separate their example from ourselves so much, and also the standard they set. The book, uh, in effect, says that these people are idealists who just cannot believe what they're seeing, so to speak, cannot believe their institutions would do this kind of thing, and think that they are acting in the finest traditions of, uh, of and are saving the institutions on which they're blowing the whistle or to which they're descending and so forth. Uh, bottom, bottom line is, in some way that maybe some they didn't even realize, they are idealists, aren't they? Absolutely. Um, the, the, um, we tend to think of dissenters or uh, these sort of in whistleblowers um, as rebellious types. Um, the, the characters I wrote about are not rebellious types. Um, they are, as you say, idealists. So if we, we return to Gruninger briefly, um, you know, here's this normal guy. Um, well, why, why does he do this? Well, one of the important reasons, one of the key factors, is that Paul Gruninger was a Swiss patriot. Um, he believed very much in this Swiss tradition 
uh, the Swiss ideal of letting, uh, of, of, of his country serving as a safe haven and a refuge for the persecuted, uh, which is very much part of Swiss national identity. Gruninger, as a consequence, when he learns of this law to bar refugees in 1938, he is, remember, he's in a part of Switzerland that borders the German Reich, that borders Austria. He's watching refugees come across the border every day. And he cannot square this with this tradition, this Swiss uh, uh, you know, national uh, value. And so what he assumes is, well, I won't enforce this law. And when the Swiss people learn of this, and when my superiors learn of this, I'll be, everyone will forgive me because they'll understand that I was doing the Swiss thing, um, in a sense. So it's, you can call it naivete, you can call it idealism, a kind of wide-eyed belief in these traditions. Of course, one Swiss uh, journalist I met who investigated Gruninger's case said, you know, of course this is a myth that we have this open, you know, that we were always this safe haven. But Gruninger really believed it. And because he believed it, he acted on it. Of course, he then realized when he was caught that the Swiss the authorities and the people would not forgive him. Uh, he was fired. He was uh, disgraced. He uh, lived the rest of his days in penury. He could not find a job. Um, so that idealism came crashing up against the reality, um, unfortunately, in his case and many of the others, I tell. Uh, ultimately, after he was dead, he became a Swiss hero didn't do him any good. That's right. Uh, he became a Swiss hero in 1993 um, when, the, when he was finally officially rehabilitated. And as I, I tell the story in the book of just how long that took, the first plea, the first public plea that I, t I describe to rehabilitate this man came in 1968. Um, he, Gruninger was still alive at that time. Now he had, he had sort of lived out these difficult years, but uh, you know, if he had been exonerated or uh, officially recognized then, then he would have maybe lived out his last days with this heroic, with this status. Not so. Um, the uh, Swiss authorities uh, denied this effort to rehabilitate him. Five separate efforts to rehabilitate him were all brushed aside. And as I investigated this, I thought, well, why is this? Why in the 80s, uh, you know, by which time most people in Switzerland look back at this law with shame? Uh, you know, at no, there's no question in most people's minds that barring refugees from fleeing Nazi Germany was wrong by the 80s. So why reject this effort to rehabilitate this guy? And then it became very clear when I sort of dug in a little deeper, if you recognize Gruninger, if you say, well, here was this guy and he did the right thing, what does it say about everybody else? What does it say about Swiss neutrality, about the, 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 the record of our country during this war, during this period when there were moral choices to be made? And unfortunately, that's the, the, the story in most of the chapters I tell, is that um, the people who stand by their principles serve as very uncomfortable reminders to everyone else of what could have been done. Uh, and that makes it very hard for them to get the recognition they deserve. What happened to the people who dissented, blew the whistle, call it, call it what you will? Like the fellow, for example, in Yugoslavia, let's start there. Sevtich, is that how you pronounce his name? Yevtich, yes. Here again, you have, uh, as, as you described, a, a guy who, who not only risks his job, risks, very much risks his life, um, uh, calling these Croats by Serbian Never names. About it. Just did it. Just did it. Yeah. Um, very, this, this, uh, this guy, Acho, uh, didn't finish high school, is, is very much this kind of ordinary bloke, um, but impulsively um, has, uh, uh, decides that, that these men are desperate and they're in danger and he's going to help them. Um, well, I... And this is a context of hundreds of years of hatred between his group and the group that, uh, uh, of which he was saving people and an absolutely bloody ethnic war um, that turned his hometown of Vukovar into rubble. Yeah. Um, and when I visited Vukovar in 2008, it was 17 years after the war between the Serbs and Croats in Vukovar, and just about every building still bore the, the scars of this war, damaged train stations that had been, you know, uh, just demolished. Uh, 
old factories full of, of, of bullet uh, and shrapnel and, and so forth. Um, so, so 17 years have passed and you would think, well, okay, uh, this guy saved people from the other side and now Vukovar is part of Croatia, so he must be a hero. He must be a local hero. Uh, not the case uh, because Vukovar at that time was, as it was before the war, still consisted of a, a Croats and Serbs, a mixed community. Well, to the Serbs, um, this guy, Acho, was, um, uh, if not a traitor, someone who had, you know, they knew what he'd done uh, during the war, but he was someone who had crossed and helped the other side. So they didn't like him for that reason. And the Croats, uh, who you would think would be uh, grateful to this man for having saved some, of, some Croats during the war and helped them, um, well, they didn't like him because he was a Serb. And furthermore, a Serb who had done the right thing. And in the minds of many Croats, the Serbs were the bad guys during the war. So couldn't, how can there couldn't be a Serb who did the right thing. There couldn't be a Serb who did the right thing. So as a consequence, this guy is a sort of, uh, you know, loner type. Uh, he, he has some friends. Uh, he has, there are a few of the men he saved who befriend him, who come to, who actually launch a campaign again to have him recognized. But uh, this is not the general sentiment. This problem about the Palestinians and the territories and the settlers, this is going on and on and on, and Wischnitzer was right in the middle of this. Yes, uh, raised in a kibbutz, and if you know something about Israel and its traditions, uh, you know that uh, if you were born and raised on a kibbutz and you're a young man, you're supposed to not just go to the army, which is universal in, in Israel, uh, you're supposed to go to the top unit. You're supposed to really uh, serve your country and, and, and excel. And uh, Avner does this. He gets into um, Sayeret Matkal, which is known simply as the unit in Israel. Uh, it's like a combination of our SEALs and uh, correct and Delta Force and, you know, you name it. Yes, it's very select. Uh, he serves there for three and a half years, six months longer than he's required to. Very patriotic guy, very idealistic. Um, after he leaves, um, he's still on reserve duty, still goes to his unit on occasion, um, but he uh, is invited by his sister to see a film, uh, to see a lecture. And he goes to the lecture and he sees some slides uh, that show some Palestinians in a part of the West Bank who are being harassed by settlers, by Jewish settlers. And Avner's not sure what to make of this because he, it doesn't, it's not something he immediately uh, thinks, well, oh, that's terrible. He, he's just bothered by it. He decides to go there, um, and, and for the first time in his life, he uh, talks to Palestinians who he realizes are just as afraid of him and afraid of Israelis as some of the Israelis he knows are afraid of, of Palestinians. Um, and this visit begins a, an awakening in him in which he gradually loses uh, the conviction that what the army is doing in the West Bank is protecting Israel. He comes to believe that actually what the army is doing th is both a moral stain on the army, an army he believes is a moral army, um, and uh, in the long term uh, guarantees uh, conflict and war between the two sides. Um, so he decides he, he wants to continue serving in the army, but he will not serve in the occupied territories, uh, and he ends up signing a letter to our, then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon saying, uh, I will not serve in the territories. Um, and he goes from being uh, this hero to being what's called uh, a refusenik uh, in Israel and, and, and really feeling ostracized. Um, the last character in the book, uh, just to bring the, the story home, we began and, and we talked about how long it took the Swiss uh, to recognize Paul Gruninger. Um, well, the, the, the last character in the book, Layla Weidler, she is not a, um, she's an American broker. She is not facing war. She is not in the middle of an ethnic conflict. Uh, but she is in the middle of a fraud. Um, and she senses that a financial fraud is being perpetrated by the, co by the company she's been hired by. Um, she gets fired, as I mentioned. She writes to the SEC and she writes to the media, to the Washington Post and other newspapers, sending them re financial reports. And, write, and, and in a letter she says, you know, this is right after the Enron scandal, 2003, she says, I fear another major scandal is, is happening. Um, you know, I, I would like uh, someone to call attention to this so investors' money can be saved. No one responds. 
She goes to arbitration. She's forced to pay back the bonus that Stanford gave her. She's ostracized from the industry. Uh, she goes through a couple of years of hell. And, and it only 2009, six years later, when uh, Stanford's uh, Ponzi scheme finally implodes, is she finally given some recognition uh, that, yes, indeed, this was true. You know, uh, for those of us <clears throat> who have had any occasion to follow Madoff and, uh, and, and or Stanford, uh, the SEC knew that Stanford was a Ponzi scheme in the early 2000s. There, there are memos there. Well, it's probably a Ponzi scheme, but somebody else has jurisdiction, so we're going to ignore it. That's right. You know, anybody, <laughs> it's enough to make me a right-wing, rock-ribbed Republican. It's, uh, Government is a disaster some of the time. You're, you're, you're right. In fact, the, the, the memos said things like, um, described the returns at Stanford as um, absolutely ludicrous and said, you know, probably Ponzi scheme or maybe Ponzi scheme years before uh, any, anyone acted on it. Um, the government failed, uh, but let's not, let's not uh, isolate the government because the industry regulation, uh, FINRA and, and, and so forth, they also failed. Yeah. So allowing this industry to self-police itself is, is, is a guarantee and, the and a recipe. Because and people the media were telling failed. the media that That's something's right. wrong. And, and, and one thing I really do want to um, drive home in the book um, is that when we read about these stories of people like Layla Weidler, who, who took the risk and, and suffered the consequences of speaking out, um, we can ask ourselves two questions. One is, well, what, what would I have done in that situation? Would I have been courageous enough? And a lot of people, if they're being honest, say, well, you know, maybe not. Maybe I would have worried about my job. Uh, but there's another question, which is, um, what would I have done if I heard about Layla Weidler? if I heard about th that, that there was some kind of Ponzi scheme going on. And the thing that I think we're all responsible for is paying attention to these voices, these people who take risks, rather than instinctively turning away or, or being apathetic. Because if more people had taken these warnings seriously, there were insiders who were saying this, both with Madoff and with Stanford, and indeed with some of the housing uh, uh, you know, shenanigans that were going on. Um, so it's it, one, one message uh, of the book is really that the responsibility begins by, by paying attention. Uh, and that doesn't take a hero to do that. No. It takes a <clears throat> citizen. I will come back to that. Uh, before we go on, briefly, Vandeveld. He was um, removed from, he, he wanted to go back uh, to service, um, but he was uh, not sent back to Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, and uh, he was also made to feel like he had betrayed his country, which uh, for Dale Vandeveld was, was, was a particularly difficult feeling to, to, to process, to, to even know what to do with, as, as, as he put it. Because this is a guy, as I said, earned a Bronze Star in Iraq, went to Guantanamo feeling that he was avenging the, uh, the, the deaths uh, that he had seen of, of members of his unit in Iraq, which suffered very heavy casualties due to IUDs and other things. Um, so he, it just brought home once again to me just uh, something about what I find so moving about these people is that because they are idealists, they really have no, that, that, that accusation of betrayal is particularly devastating. You know, if you're a rebel, if you don't care, you know, you might even welcome it. Yeah, right. I betrayed, well, you know, that's, that's what some people but you, do. But you know, you do, you do say, I can't believe you're wrong. I can't believe you could be wrong. That all these people, <clears throat> the ones you write about, all the others, they, there must be at least one person on their side, one person who believes them. Because if you're truly standing all alone, completely all alone, against government, a large organization, social, social convention, oh man, that's bad. That's, that's true, and, and, and actually, um, you know, in each story, of the, each story in the book is about an individual, but as, as you read into the story, you discover there's a co-conspirator, or, or more than one sometimes. Um, I didn't know that going in. Um, in the case of uh, uh, Acho, uh, the Serb, um, you know, I won't, I won't uh, ruin the suspense, but, but I, I was amazed to discover that, in fact, uh, there were people very close to him in that community um, who uh, not only uh, supported what he did, um, but actually had helped him 
when he was vulnerable. Um, in the case of uh, uh, Paul Gruninger, uh, you had uh, an, an, another person in the same area of Switzerland, in St. Gallen, an official who certainly knew what Gruninger was doing. We have clear evidence of that and clearly approved it or did not uh, disapprove it. Um, so you had uh, these co-conspirators and, and it, it does, you're right, raise, raise a very important point, which is that, um, you know, in that story I tell in the beginning of the book, when the commander says, well, if any of the older men uh, don't want to participate in this massacre, please step forward, put your gun down. Well, one person does so and then another half dozen. And what does that teach us? Well, it becomes a lot easier when, some, when even one person comes forward to say, no, I'm not going to do this. It, there's sort of a, 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 a contagion, a small contagious effect that can occur. You talk and you've talked here about group pressure, social solidarity. This last example is reverse social solidarity when you mm -hmm. get right down to it. Uh, Th these are, uh, you know, you might, might explain this, for example, in terms of Vanderbilt, because it's a very contemporary thing, and in terms of the Israeli uh, Defense Forces, because uh, in both of these, the highest stakes are involved as a human and military and, and matter, and as a matter of national survival in Israel's case, and a lot of people here have claimed it's a matter of national survival in our case. Uh, it's, it's explain the way that social pressure operates in these situations. Uh, for example, for, for an Israeli soldier uh, at age 18, um, you know, you're uh, just beginning to develop a sense of identity. And for someone like Avner, as for many 18-year-old um, Israelis, um, the uh, feeling of uh, contributing to your society is uh, hinges on this notion of military service. And if you don't do it, um, then what are you? You're outside of the consensus. You are, um, you know, you, you are in a sense uh, left alone. Um, in the case of uh, Daryl Vandeveld, this intense loyalty he felt to the men he served with um, and this fear he had that um, in following his conscience he might be perceived to be betraying them even if he didn't feel he was betraying them. Um, the fear that you are betraying uh, the group that you have a loyalty to can be so powerful that it just shuts down uh, conscience. And I don't think that's particular to Israelis. I don't think it's particular to Americans. I think it's human. Uh, we are social animals. Uh, we need to feel part of some community in some form. And uh, that's why uh, it can overwhelm uh, the impulse one has to go on one's own. And I think closely related to that is the sense that since nobody else seems to see anything wrong here, and this would be particularly true of the case of Weidler, I must be nuts. That's right. Well, one, yes, and this was a very striking thing in the, in the chapter I, I wrote about the whistleblower, Le Leila Weidler, in the financial industry. And I, I interviewed a couple of other uh, people at Stanford who, after her, uh, also blew the whistle and also um, said something or resigned or, or got fired. Um, and one thing that kept coming up, they thought, they, they knew they were on to something, and yet they also, a part of them, thought, maybe I'm crazy. Am I, am I just seeing things here? Because, you know, the industry regular, regulators say it's fine. Um, you know, the, uh, all kinds of uh, media outlets say they're fine. Alan Stanford is on Forbes' list of, you know, the 100 wealthiest people in the world. Uh, he's on CNN being asked, you know, is it fun to be a billionaire? Maybe I'm the, maybe I'm the crazy Not one. Not bad. <laughs> um, that's right. Um, and, and so, uh, and, and the reason I think that sentiment comes up among the whistleblowers is because unlike in the other chapters, where people are in war, where they can see the dramatic stakes in front of them. For the financial industry workers, you're, t you're talking about paper you're pushing, you know, a product you're selling, percentages, reports. It all looks fine. And you're very far from seeing, you know, uh, a person who's just lost all their savings. You don't see that in front of you. So it really requires a great deal of imagination. And, uh, and, and, and you have to follow your suspicion and trust your gut. And Layla and these other people do trust their guts, 
But along the way, they are sometimes prone to thinking, well, maybe I'm, making, maybe I'm not seeing straight. And indeed, one of the um, wives of, of a guy who worked at Stanford, when he said, I'm, 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 you know, I don't think this is right, she said to him, you know, I think, are you nuts? You know, they, they were, from their own family members being asked, were they nuts? The question of physical or bureaucratic distance from the victim is a most important question, and I would say it's in major part because of something you just mentioned, lack of imagination. That's right. Um, I, I think that, that that's one of the most important uh, factors leading these ordinary people to act. Uh, again, if we, if we look at Paul Gruninger, I mentioned his Swiss patriotism, um, but there was something else about Gruninger that distinguished him. Um, he made what the authorities in Switzerland considered a big mistake. He let the refugees come directly to his, the police headquarters, to his office in St. Gallen, in this area of Switzerland. He saw them. He heard them. He saw their faces. He went to the border. He saw how they were, you know, people were wading through and trying and doing debt arriving in despair. And because he, he, it was, he was in direct contact with it, he told his daughter, who I interviewed, I, I simply couldn't do anything else. Now, the fact of the matter is, sure, he could have done something else. He could have stopped going to those places. He could have stopped thinking about these people. But it's very clear from psychological experiments that have been done, and also from the record that we have of, of human history, that when people are put in direct physical proximity to the people who may be harmed by their acts, they have a much harder time carrying through with those acts. If you are distanced, and it can be a psychological distance, it can be, you know, oh, these aren't really people, these are just Jews, or, um, you know, a uh, kind of ideological distance. Um, I'm not really shooting at a person, I'm shooting at the enemy, or I'm shooting at commies, or whatever you want to substitute for that. It becomes easier because you, you have a layer of psychological separation from the act. In Gruninger's case, he sees these people directly, and he doesn't see them as Jews. He sees them as human beings, um, as people who are in desperate need of help. Um, and in the case of uh, uh, Acho, the uh, Serb, um, again, he sees these guys in this detention camp uh, as human beings, not as uh, Croats or as his you know, ancient ethnic uh, enemy. Um, so a persistent theme of, of the book is that um, we, uh, we live in a world where unfortunately we can achieve this distance very easily uh, in bureaucratic organizations, uh, through training that distances us and conditions us to act without thinking. We need to fight that because um, if you are close enough in proximity and you actually see that someone actually will be harmed and it's a person, it becomes much harder to follow through on that action. Yeah. I mean, so, so many people simply shrug their shoulders and say, what can I do? I can't stand against the machine. That's, uh, you know, I, I, I wrestled this with this a little bit as, as, as an author uh, in telling these stories because I would be lying if, if I presented, um, as sometimes Hollywood films do, presented the person who goes against the grain, or the whistleblower who decides to do the right thing, as uh, the person who um, gets you know, the reward at the end. Uh, I talk about uh, the film Aaron Brockovich, which is a very good, good movie. Um, I enjoyed it, but it tells a story that unfortunately uh, doesn't match reality. This uh, young uh, woman who, uh, who ends up, uh, uh, in a sense, exposing and blowing the whistle on a big company's poisoning of the water, uh, what's her reward? She gets a million dollar check and she rides into the sunset. Well, actual whistleblowers in the United States, despite the laws we have protecting them, tend to lose their jobs. They tend to lose their homes. Many of them uh, watch their families break apart. They suffer years of psychological uh, problems and feeling ostracized. Um, this is the unfortunate reality. And it does, uh, you know, I can understand why people might read these stories and say, well, gee, if this, if this is the result, why in the world uh, would anyone 
uh, become such a person. I hope that's not the conclusion they come, they, they come away with, and, and there is another side to it, but, but that's certainly a risk. The University of Michigan sends its graduates an email magazine once every couple of weeks, so I just got the latest one. And uh, lo and behold, it turns out that Raoul Wallenberg attended the University of Michigan. They came from the Rockefellers of Sweden, but his father, you know, objected to all that highfalutin mm. stuff uh, of the, uh, that was engaged in by the wealthy of Europe, so he sent him to uh, Michigan in the United States. Well, Ra Wallenberg, of course, uh, you know, saved hundreds of, of thousands of Jews, apparently. He didn't ride off into the sunset. The Russians got him and they killed him. And yeah. Russians have never admitted it, but right. of course that's what they did. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you're playing with your life sometimes. And right. a lot, there were people who knew about Bernie Madoff, uh, uh, um, what's his name, uh, Harry Markopoulos, who cl has claimed from the day he came into the public eye that he was afraid of being rubbed out. Right. Which is not an, in an insane kind of fear given the stakes that were involved. No. I mean, maybe now that we know what was going on, it seems insane. But gosh, I wouldn't have thought it would necessarily was insane uh, at that time. So uh, this has happened to me. But let me ask you a question that you alluded to there. When, when people know this, well, why, would, why would anybody blow the whistle? Well, um, I think that uh, the stories in the book, the, uh, the fact that um, human nature, we, we've had so many books written in the last half century, and rightly so, about conformity, about evil, about people, um, uh, in a sense, stooping to the worst uh, in humanity. Um, and, uh, and understandably so, because we've seen from after World War II, one case after another in Rwanda, in um, you know, Cambodia, in, uh, in the Balkans, uh, where groupthink did take hold, where people did uh, uh, commit mass atrocities and, and so forth. But there's another side of the story. There's another um, side of humanity. And, um, and it's the side of humanity that is represented by um, this guy, Alexander Yevtich, who uh, is not a particularly sophisticated guy, um, but feels an impulse, feels an instinct to empathize with people who are in trouble. Um, and I feel that uh, one lesson of the book is that, um, you know, often it's less important what you've read about and what you think your values are in the abstract than the crucible of experience, than, than being um, exposed to human suffering and feeling like, you know, I, I really can't uh, turn turn the turn away from this uh, in this particular moment um, it may be risky uh, but I'm gonna do it anyway sometimes it helps in, in, in Acho's case uh, not to think too much you know if you if you start calculating the risks um, yeah, the arts aren't good. but there's another side to it um, and that's the the question of facing yourself um, at the end of the day and and you know these these different characters um, from Leila Weidler to Avner Wischnitzer on down to Daryl Vandeveld um, they go through a process of um, looking inside of, and you know the, the uh, conscience is often referred to as the inner voice um, and ask themselves well you know what can I live with can I live with being a person who believes uh, in these values and has acted on these values up until this point but stops now um, and in each case they decide they're more afraid to be untrue to themselves than they are to face the consequences of, you know, mm -hmm. being uh, disloyal to their boss or fired from their company or whatever it is, and that's um, that empathy. I think is is a natural trait, and it is in all people. Yeah, you describe them as interdirected people in the, the 1950s. Uh, that's idea. right. Yes, um, and 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 they they. Um, and, and they, they look inside themselves, and one very important um, aspect of this that, that I think gets overlooked, when we think of people who are whistleblowers or people who are conscientious objectors, we often think of them as people who, um, in a sense, put themselves, put the individual before the group. They, they act on their own, uh, for their own, um, you could almost say, self-interested or selfish uh, ideals. 
Um, but look at the consequences of their actions. The people who benefit from these selfish acts are the rest of us, if, if we're listening, if we're paying attention, or the people they help, and so forth. Whereas the conformists, who supposedly act for society, can end up going along and creating a ruinous situation where everybody is harmed. Um, let's think of a recent scandal in Penn State. Imagine the people at that university, the number of people who today wish, out of loyalty to the university that they love, that they had said something, or they, if they knew something, if they saw something, that someone there had acted or spoken up before this all happened. Um, now, the fact is, uh, nobody did. And, and or, yeah, as far as we know, so far, maybe a story will come out eventually that, that someone did try to speak out. Of course, some victims and victims' families did. But no one in a sufficient position of authority um, did the right thing in that case. The consequence has been terrible for the institution to which everyone thought they were being loyal by not speaking out. Um, and so we need to see this in, in, in that kind of light, that, that someone like a Daryl Vandeveld, um, who is uh, you know, acting for himself, um, is actually acting for an ideal that we all have a stake in, I think. You touched on something that I have heard nothing about in the news media. Maybe I've just missed it. And it's my strongest impression from the Penn State debacle, and I think your book goes far to prove it, is that when you, when people cover things up and hide the truth in order to protect something they value highly, they're going to end up creating a worse disaster than if they had revealed the truth immediately so that people could put a stop to what was going on. And when you talk about the Nazis, when you talk about uh, Yugoslavia, when you talk about uh, Penn State, when you talk about the Stanford uh, business, I don't see how those, all those things do anything but support the point that I've just made and that I think you made, which is, you're just, now the question becomes though, I mean, it's a, here's a question a lot of people wrestle with. All right, we hear from dissenters and whistleblowers every day, much of it is wrong. How, how do we separate out what is valuable and should be pursued from what is wrong? Well, that, that, that's a very legitimate question, and I should say, um, we haven't touched on it yet, but I should say that uh, the fact of the matter is, I've written a book about acts of conscience. Now, conscience is uh, this, as I said, this inner voice. It <coughs> isn't necessarily admirable. Um, a person can act on conscience um, to, to uh, uh, shout out a racist slogan uh, because they, are, uh, they believe uh, a certain racial group is inferior in accordance with their inner voice, their conscience. I happen to think that's reprehensible, but the person who uh, has, uh, has acted that way has been, quote unquote, true to their inner belief. Um, it's not necessarily the case that a person who steps out of line and breaks the law or refuses to enforce it or disobeys an order is doing it for admirable purposes. Um, courage can be immoral um, as well as moral. Um, a whistleblower can be uh, right on and, and, and a, trying to expose a fraud. And a whistleblower can also be a little unhinged uh, and, and wasting the time of an agency. Um, so it's not as simple as every time the, d the lone dissenter shouts, we should all mm -hmm. take that as the truth. Clearly not. Um, that said, I do conclude the book by, by, by saying, uh, and I repeat a point made by Cass Sunstein, uh, the legal scholar. Uh, he wrote a book called Why Societies Need Dissent. Um, we need dissent, uh, and we need it uh, because we are prone to groupthink. We are prone to um, information cascades that lead us all to think everything's just fine because, the, because, because everyone else already said it's fine. Uh, look at the financial crash uh, of 2008. How many people who should have known better didn't say anything in time when there might have been something done about it. Um, I talk in the book about the um, Gulf oil spill. 
uh, there were workers who knew that there were problems on that rig and safety uh, problems and, uh, and so forth, but they were afraid uh, to come forward. Uh, we need to create uh, a society where those who speak out have some mechanism to both be s protected from retaliation so that they're silenced and also to have their voices heard. Um, and it's true, you're right, uh, we can't hear, you know, there are some voices who will speak out who probably don't deserve uh, the attention. Um, but in my experience from, from having written this book, I think we need more, we need to do more listening to the dissenters among us and not less. One attempt to accomplish what you're speaking of, the Federal Whistleblower Act, is more than, abysmal, than an abysmal failure. It is beyond belief a failure. It doesn't work for anybody. The depressing truth I learned reporting this, the, the uh, chapter on whistleblowers is that uh, we've had many fine, uh, w nicely worded laws protecting whistleblowers from retaliation <coughs> passed, and almost none of them have done anything to protect whistleblowers. Um, I talk about, uh, uh, I, I mentioned Enron earlier. Well, after the Enron and other debacles, uh, the accounting scandals, 2002, there was a very nice uh, law passed, the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, protection, that uh, us, we thought protected workers in the corporate world who reported fraud from retaliation. Well, I cite a study in the Wall Street Journal reported seven or eight years later that something like 17 out of 1,200 cases of retaliation, the worker actually got protection. Um, so why does this happen? Well, I think partly it's because um, there is an effort immediately after these laws uh, are passed to water them down uh, or to not protect the people. In, in the case of Sarbanes-Oxley, the Bush administration appointed judges to a government uh, uh, agency that, that basically didn't seem to, seem to be doing everything possible to gut that law. This, this will probably uh, bring it down on my head, but uh, I would say the legal profession is uh, in significant respects uh, responsible for this. Uh, lawyers who are attempting to protect the worst evildoers, judges who buy their arguments, I mean, it's just, it's just morally criminal, if you ask me, and it's the legal system that we're stuck with. Well, it's, you know, the legal side of, of this whole question is um, both an important one and a disheartening uh, one, both in, in, in I mentioned the whistleblower uh, context, but the law, be the law also plays a very significant role in other chapters in my book, those that where I describe, for example, the responsibility of soldiers. Um, what happens when a soldier is given an unjust order um, and they think it's unjust? Uh, do they have uh, a duty to disobey that order? Um, from what I understand, from what I uh, learned, uh, the idea that a soldier is indeed, uh, that it is indeed <coughs> the responsibility of a soldier not to carry forward with an Im an, a, a manifestly illegal order, an unjust order, is a very new thing. Um, and it hasn't been clearly worked out in courts, uh, despite all of the international human rights accords we have. Uh, you say that it stems from a fellow named Lasse Oppenheim, I gather, a German writer of the uh of the uh, 1900s who, who established the principle that a uh, soldier, uh, you know, is excused if he's following orders. That's about what it comes down to. That's right. That was the, the, the so-called superior orders defense was yeah. pretty much accepted from what I understand. It was, it was part <coughs> of the U.S. military code, the British military code. All Western countries kind of had this idea that if a soldier got orders to do something, they are not responsible. Um, then we had World War II and the Nuremberg trials, and we had the case of, well, how are we going to hold uh, Nazis responsible for what they did? And the codes were revised. So now it is recognized that you can't simply invoke superior orders, that yeah. sometimes you get an order that is manifestly illegal, but there's still a lot uh, legally and morally to work out. In that. Y you know, uh, that was one of the reasons I expect why a lot of people took umbrage against the Nuremberg trials, not necessarily or not, not even at all because they wanted to protect Nazis, but because they said, you're invoking a new law which didn't exist before. To, my, to which my answer is, so what? 
Well, right. I mean, know. maybe maybe the, the, the lesson to be drawn from that is that the previous law and the legal regime was a flawed one. Um, well, and worse than fraud, it, w it was an immoral, turned out to be to be an immoral regime, and, and yet that immorality was used as the defense. I was just following orders. Give me a break. Now, you know, who knows what that's going to mean for our country in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years, because there's been a strong movement to say that whatever we did, if you disagree with it, you must nonetheless reckon with the fact that people were doing what they were ordered to do by, from the very highest levels. That's right. I mean, let's, let's take the example of uh, officially sanctioned torture during the, the Bush era. Um, no, uh, no one has been held accountable, prosecuted, um, and one reason for that is that um, uh, people say, those who, who uh, defend the, the lack of accountability say, well, but this was what was sanctioned by the government. So why was anyone, uh, why can anyone be held accountable? I do believe that the people at the top hold the most responsibility and we should, we should you know, clearly recognize that when people get orders, there is a lot of pressure to follow them. But should that exonerate ev everyone of, of, of accountability? I don't think so. You know, this is a kind of a problem which arises throughout history in that uh, people say, well, everybody else thought this was the right thing to do and I couldn't stand against it and I was just carrying out my duty. <clears throat> well, there comes a time when, uh, I, I, I would say, when you have a greater responsibility than merely to carry out your duty as you, you know, what, what is said to be your duty. And I think the greatest example of that in American history, and this will win me no plaudits, believe me, is Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee should never have gone with the South. He should never have fought against the Union. But the uh, argument was, well, he's a Southerner, it's his family. Well, other members of his family, his cousin Samuel, uh, Samuel Lee, I think his name was, was a Union Admiral. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, these tragic things occur, and I think a lot of people simply make the wrong decision about it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you one other thing that just really fascinated me. It sort of changes the subject yeah. for the last 50 seconds. Sure. You, you, you'd say that what causes people to do the right thing is what I think you call imagined empathy or empathy of the imagination. And, and you say that this started in roughly the 1700s because of the spread of pr novels which is attributable, of course, to printing and Gutenberg, and to the fact that people became more au courant with, I guess as they traveled throughout Europe, art, and they saw human beings. Talk about that just a little bit. What a difference these things made in the way people see other people. Well, I'm, I'm borrowing there from the historian Lynn Hunt, but um, I, do, I, do, I don't think it's a coincidence that um, novels that depict the lives of, of individuals and went into the interiors of their lives um, became mass and, and very popular in the same, at the same time that campaigns were launched to ban torture, that human rights started to, be, to filter into the discourse of Western civilization. This is what Lynn Hunt describes. I think there's something to me very convincing about that because I think that our greatest weapon um, for good or bad um, is the imagination, the power to imagine ourselves in the shoes of another person who is suffering. Now, unfortunately, we can also imagine that, you know, whole races of people are less than us, and this is the, the dark side of the imagination. My book is about the, uh, in a sense, the, the more um, uh, enlightened aspect of the human imagination. <coughs> well, Eyal, thank you for being with us. Thank you uh, very much. I understand much. that your next book is going to be about people who were perhaps even in the very same situations and did not blow the whistle and who went along. Well, I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the early stages, I'll say. Uh, and then Write that book. Thank you. That's important. That's important because that's <clears throat> a descriptor of more people's situations than the current book. Mm. And that's very important. Anyhow, thank you very much for being with us. Thank to you. To the audience, thank you and be with us again. Mm -hmm.